Okay, we are going to wrap this series up today of winning the day. I hope everybody's gotten something out of this and it's helped you in your daily lives and hopefully we'll carry on things that will help you in the future. Uh, as we know, we divide this into three parts. The first part we talked about burying dead destinies flipping, by flipping the script and kissing the wave. In other words, don't let all those problems from the past. Every time you've failed all the problems you've had, don't let them weigh you down. Don't get let them get in the way. We just sung about it, didn't we? Amazing grace. My chains are gone. I've been set free because God has ransomed me, right? And we need to let that stuff go. God's already forgiven us. Sometimes we need to forgive ourselves and say, that's in the past. It's time to learn from the lessons of the past, but don't dwell on it. Let's focus on today. And then we talked about winning the day, eating the frog, setting our priorities right, doing those tough things, learning how to get those tough things done, and then flying the kite, remembering that... Not to despise the day of small beginnings. Be willing to start small and work from there. And then we went into this last part, which is imagine underborn tomorrows. You know, in order to accomplish what we have to day, do today, we still have to know where we're going. So we talked about cutting the rope, winding the clock. And today we're going to talk about seed the clouds. You ever see the cloud? Well, let's see where we go with that. And seed the cloud. All right. On November 13th, 1946, a plane took off from Schenectady County Airport. Kind of a unique flight, actually, and a unique payload. It carried six pounds of dry ice. You're thinking, dry ice? What's so big about that? Well, its mission was to seed the clouds with solidified carbon dioxide in hopes of creating enough condensation to cause precipitation. See, they noticed this situation around this New York. They were noticing there was always clouds in the sky. There was obviously precipitation up there, but it wasn't coming down. Why? How can we make it rain? How can we bring rain or snow down or something? So this one guy, he got to go, going on. The, so basically months before that flight, there was a chemist, Vincent Schaefer. He had been experimenting at the General Electric Research Laboratory it's called the House of Magic is what it was nicknamed, I guess. And using a GE freezer, he chilled to sub-zero temperature he created clouds using his breath. You know what he did? He created this cold atmosphere. And his, oh, ever do that on a window? Yeah, or on a cold window and you see it all steam up. He's creating a cloud. And then he would experiment with as he's creating this cloud, he would drop various different chemicals in. He's certain for something will cause a reaction and cause this moisture to solidify and fall. And he just goes on month after month everything's failing it's not working and then all of a sudden one day he used dry ice wow matter of fact one version i heard of this said the dry ice was even an accident you know sometimes you can find discoveries if you're looking for it by accident uh, i was told for whatever reason maybe the weather conditions were such he was having trouble getting the cooler down cool enough so he decided to help it out a little bit by taking some dry ice in there to make the atmospheric conditions colder and the dry ice is what triggered it so basically he goes up and he drops this dry ice into the clouds to see what happened it said eyewitnesses on the ground too quick on me <laughs> eyewitnesses on the ground um, said that it looked as if the sky just exploded he produced all this uh, snow and so forth and come down. So the subsequent snowfall was visible for 40 miles. The GE monogram, which I'm assuming was a paper, had a little fun with Schaefer's, uh, Schaefer's breakthrough. He says, Schaefer made it snow this afternoon over at Pittsfield. Next week he walks on water. <laughs> so, you see the science of seeing clouds may be a modern day marvel. And... But it didn't start here and didn't end here. Actually, shortly after that, I understand they found out there was a better uh, chemical rather than dry ice that would actually do the job. But at this point, it was a big discovery. But um, it's been around forever. Matter of fact, there was a famine that lasted three and a half years in the Bible. And Elijah seeded, uh, seeded the clouds with a brave prayer. Now we'll go on to Elijah. Let's uh, set the scene here where we're at. This is the 9th century BC. So you're talking maybe around 850 or so, give or take a few years, uh, BC. Uh, ruler of Israel at that time, the king was King Ahab. Of course, he married Jezebel. 
He permitted her to worship Baal and persecute God's prophets. Matter of fact, she was killing off God's prophets. She was a pretty evil lady. And uh, one of the reasons why when you marry and you choose a spouse, you don't find somebody who worships different than you do and does not have the same spiritual beliefs. If you do, I'm warning you, you're heading for trouble. But we won't dwell on that now because that's not the uh, focus of this particular mission. But it is an important point to remember. So basically, because of all that had gone on, and there was a famine for three and a half years. But all of a sudden, God told a, um, Elijah to go to Ahab, says, for I will send rain. So then he goes to see him, and there's a show down at Mount Carmel. You may have remembered that story. Basically, Elijah and God versing 450 prophets of Baal. Yeah, it's not the numbers you have, it's the power you have, is it not, that wins out in that battle? And when they had the showdown, the Baal's prophets, they prayed from morning to evening. They beat their chefs. They cut themselves at all kinds of things. The challenge was to try and ask your God to light up this. They both had built altars. They both put sacrifices on it. So they asked Baal, light this sacrifice on fire. Nothing. All day long. Finally, Elijah says, hold on here, man. My turn. You spent all day. He calls, has them bring in water, and he says, drench that thing. Put water, which, that water must have been valuable at the time. We're in a famine, but Elijah knew more water was coming. He had them drench this whole thing. Now, it was hard, it'd be hard enough to light something that's dry. Now you've got this totally soaked. And Elijah prays once. The fire that God sent down was so intense that it not only burned up the sacrifice, it dried up all the water that had been poured on it and burned up the whole altar. It said the stones even were burned. And after that, Elijah killed Baal's prophets. So that is the story leading up to where we're going, but the real place we're going to, let's look at what happened when he started to seed the clouds. So let's go on. In 1 Kings 18, we're going to start with verse 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, Go and eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down on the ground, and put his face between his knees. You know, I underline this one uh, portion in here because I find two key things in there. Let's go eat and drink. To me, this is a statement of faith. I sat and wondered for this, and then I looked in a study Bible and some notes, and I pointed out, and I thought, wow, that is really a strength of faith. Why did he say go eat and drink? Elijah had so much faith that this was going to happen, he basically told the king, he said, you can go over there and start celebrating. It's going to happen. You go ahead and start partying. I'll go do the work. You go party. And then he said, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. Question. Did anybody else hear rain? Why could Elijah hear rain and nobody could, else could? He said he heard a sound. There is a sound. We're going to hit on that some more later, so let's move on. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the serpent re uh, servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds, and the wind rose. A heavy rain came on Ahab, and he rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. I'm sure you've heard people talk about this before. There must have been a funny scene. I mean, this guy's got a horse and a chariot, and he's going on, and all of a sudden, here comes a little old Elijah with his cloak tucked up, and he's running, and he's just speeding on by him. Well, not only that, not only was that speed something that he must have had the power to do, it was also the distance. I never took the time to do this. Somebody took the time. They said, depending on the route he did, the minimum distance between those points was 17 miles. And depending on the route, it could have been as many as 30 miles. So he outran the, the horse and chariot 
for a distance of 17 to 30 miles. Anybody prepared for a marathon? That's the kind of conditioning he had that day. Okay. We want to take a look at this and see how it ties in with seeding the clouds. Three steps we're going to look over here today with seeding the clouds. There's probably more things we could throw in this. Let's focus on these three first. First, prophetic imagination. Elijah presented himself to Ahab because he heard the word of the Lord. See, he said right here, if we go back in the beginning, well, the story I told you about, we didn't look at the scripture, said the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send the rain on the land. Elijah heard the Lord. Why did he hear him? First off, he heard him say, go to Ahab. That was one thing. And then he said, why he's sending him? I'm going to send rain. So this is the first time Elijah's been told, as far as we know, that there is rain coming. So let's go announce it. So he went and did that, and then he says, for there's a sound of heavy rain. We just covered that in this later portion, for there's a sound of heavy rain. Once again, he says, I heard the rain. So several times here we see where he has heard from the Lord. So why could Elijah hear rain when no one else could? There have been other times. Uh, well, here, here, here's an example of, of something that happened that can give you an idea why we can't hear if you can relate it. More than half a century ago, Dr. Alfred Tomatis was confronted with the most curious case of his 50-year career. Uh, this is a doctor of some field that I'm not even going to try and pronounce the name of what he was, but it basically was the same as an ear, note, an ear, ear nose, and throat specialist. Um, the same thing, but there's a big old title for what he was. And there was a renowned opera singer that has lost his ability to hit certain notes, even though those notes were well within his vocal range. He couldn't hit those notes anymore. Why is that? So, using a sonometer, Dr. Tomatis discovered that the opera singer was producing 140 decibel sound waves at a meter's distance. That's louder than a military jet taking off from an aircraft carrier. Would you imagine the effect of that? Would you like to hear that? And what he found out, he could no longer, that he, the opera singer had been deafened by the sound of his own voice. He produced a strong talent. He had actually gone deaf in certain tones. He had damaged his hearing. Basically, he could no longer hit the notes because he could no longer hear the notes. And the doctor said the voice can only reproduce what the ear can hear. Can we reproduce if we can't hear? Elijah was able to hear. Basically, they, they put a name on that. Uh, they called that the Tomatis, Tomatis effect is what they ended up renaming it. But you can't obey God's direction for your life. You can't hear them. Problems in life can drown out God's voice. Relational, emotional, spiritual. All these problems we're fighting with, we need to get them under control. If we're so busy during our day fighting problems, when do we have the time to hear God's voice? Ooh. Kind of ties into Angie's special, doesn't it? God is sitting there waiting to talk with us, but we're too busy with other things. Now you know why you were given this special today. It ties right in. If we can't hear God because we're so tied up with problems... Or how about distractions that drown out his voice? How about news media? You spend much time listening to the news media, turn the news off. If you're going to turn it on, turn it on briefly to see if there's anything new and then turn it off. Do not sit all day and listen to the news. Because I don't know if there's a single non-biased news agency out there. They all have their slant on it. And they are trying to gain attention. But while they're gaining your attention, they're distracting you from the work that God has for you. Or how about social media? You spend a lot of time on social media, it'll poison your soul. I'm not saying there aren't valid purposes of social media. We have a page for our church too. And I look for certain things, but I block so many things and say, don't send me this thing. And I ignore so many things. And I do not spend a lot of time on it. 
I spend short little brief times looking to see is there anything important I need to know about that's going on in somebody's lives, our friends' lives. I want to hear from friends. I want it to be true social networking with my friends, not all this garbage that's out there. If you're so busy with that news media and social networks and your problems, you won't be, have time to hear God's voice. We start seeding the clouds by getting rid of the problems and distractions and focusing on hearing God's word. It's that simple. So we need that so that we can see what he's calling for him to do because prophetic imagination, we want our guidance to come from God. And then patient persistence. In the first century BC, there was also a similar experience to what Elijah experienced. There was a man uh, who basically had an anointing like Elijah, very uh, wanted to follow God faithfully. And the people asked him to pray for rain, and he did something interesting. He took his staff, drew a circle in the sand, then he knelt inside that circle and he prayed this prayer. Sovereign Lord, I swear before your great name that I will not leave the circle until you have mercy upon your children. Well, talk about faith. That's a bit of faith, isn't it? I'm not leaving here until you answer my prayer. <laughs> and he's going in there. Hani the circle maker, I hope I pronounced that right, I was ca uh, captivated by one phrase in the verse of uh, Scripture in Psalms 126.1. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. We were like men who dreamed is what he captivated on. And he realized we have to have dreams. And we have to stick with them. Do dreams come true? Sometimes... If we quit, will they come true? No. We have to actively go out and seek for them. And the thought that it's, it's, it's said with his entire life is that he wanted it's impossible a person to dream continuously for 70 years. How many of you find you had more dreams when you were younger? How many were ready when you were young to conquer the world? You could, you could do anything you set your mind to, right? You had bold dreams and you were going to go out and do it. At what point in your life did you stop dreaming and just say, this is reality? There's reasons for this. There was, there's been studies done that show we age, as we age, the cognitive center of the gra uh, gravity tends to shift from the right brain to the left brain. The left brain is the center of logic. The right brain is the center of imagination. In other words, when we start out younger in life, our thoughts are being focused out of this area of the brain that has all that imagination. But after a while, we shift over into memory. This is what we, how we do it. This is how it's done. This is going to be the result. I don't care how many times you try it. It's been proven in the past. This is what happens. So we may as well accept it, right? And we stop imagining and we stop stretching our ability. And that problem presents that at some point, most of us stop living out of imagination. We start living out of memory. We stop creating the future and start repeating the past. We stop living by faith and start living by logic. And that is when we stop living and start dying. Do you want to be alive or dead? Most people die long before the date of their death certificate. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can continue, even at an older age, staying active and imagining new things. One of the statements I heard being in the maintenance field a lot of times, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that's what happens when we get older in life. You know, we tinker with things when we're young. We want to try and things to fix it and make things better. But that, as we get older, leave it alone. It's working. Don't mess with it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There are times that's valid. Some people monkey where they shouldn't, quite frankly. And there are some things, and being from the maintenance field, I know there's sometimes, leave it alone, it's working. But that doesn't always apply. The question is, how do you know it's not broken? 
If you accept everything as it is, how do you know it's not broken? It could very well be broken and you've just adapted to it and you're working in a broke setup yourself. Too many people are the same way about that too. Too many people, I run into people all the time and say, I, I get frustrated because I want to talk with people, I want to help people. You know, you want to talk with me, don't tell me how things work. Have a conversation with me, let's exchange ideas. We'll figure out each other's problems. But most people aren't willing to do that because too many people are saying, don't try to fix me, I'm not broken. Everybody thinks some, uh, they're all right, you know, in this world where, what does that I say, you do you, boo-boo? You do whatever you want. Everybody thinks that's fine, do what you want. Sometimes we have to say, am I doing the right thing? Is there a way I can improve? But too many of us have decided, this is the way I'm going to do it. Expanding the imagination allows us to recognize new and better ways to accomplish things, most importantly in our own lives and then also how we relate to others. You know, we fix ourselves first if we're smart. You try and go and fix other people before you fix yourself, you're going to run into a problem. Oh, isn't there some scripture about somewhere? Splinter in someone else's eye when you got a plank in your own? Too many people are walking around with planks. If we've actually drew images of what people really look like, including ourselves, we might be a little bit embarrassed. If you keep doing the same thing you've always done, you're going to continue to get the same results. You've heard that before, haven't you? Sometimes we have to step outside of our comfort zone. We have to think outside the box. We have to do things different, but too many times we don't. And bold prayer. We need to pray for God's guidance. We need to continue to uh, pray boldly and persistently. There is no expiration date on love. There is no expiration date on faith. And there is no expiration date on prayer. Too many times we give up too easy. Because I've been praying about it and it hasn't happened. Didn't we just talk about that in the concept of time? God's time is, is different than ours. If you have to pray for a week, pray for a week. If you have to pray for a year, pray for a year. If you have to pray for 10 years, pray for 10 years. If you pray your whole life, pray. If that's what God has given you to pray about it, pray about it. You may not even see the answer to prayer. You know how, people, how many people have spent their lives investing in doing God's work? And the fruit of their work occurred after their death. God's time is different than our time. So we have to be persistent and stick with it. And I'd rather have one God, God idea than a thousand good ideas. How many biz are busy chasing ideas? Some of us are caught in memory. We don't chase ideas. Somebody chased too many ideas. We need to sort through those ideas, maybe. And too many times we give up or quit because we're looking for instant success or instant gratification. We need to remember that God is not on the same time frame, but winning the day is all about staying persistent and faithful on God's given vision to you. So get rid of the distracting clutter in your life. Distinguish between good ideas and God ideas. God ideas should always come first. Look for those, which means we got to get rid of some of that clutter so that we can hear those ideas. And seeding the clouds is all about patient persistence. Consistency beats intensity. It's too soon to quit. Too soon to give up. We need to keep working to accomplish God's purposes. When I saw the seed, the cloud thing, I thought of different things on it. The main teaching on the idea is the persistent and seeking God's idea. But I also kind of thought of the thing, well, seed in the clouds, I thought, he kept trying, he's finding a way to force this thing to rain. I'm thinking, we need to make things happen. I think to a certain extent there is that, but we have to be careful not to get a hold of God. We try and do it on our own, we're liable to stumble. But make sure that God isn't sitting there waiting for you to do your part. 
There are times where we have to say, okay, God, give me this idea. I've been praying about it. I've been working out the ideas, waiting for the right time. And God's sitting there saying, but the time has passed. You're losing ground. I told you to do something with it. Where's that balance? I don't know. I wish I knew. I still struggle with it. We all need to struggle with that. But we need to put it in practice. So we need to work on winning the day. And we're only going to do it when we put all these pieces and probably many others together. But this is a good starting point. I've only briefly covered the things that were covered in the Win the Day book. If you haven't done it already, you might want to consider buying the book Win the Day by Mark Batterson. Because I've only told you a fraction of what he covers in that book. It's a book you can reread multiple times and still draw good things out of it. And he also has some of his teachings out on YouTube, too, where he's broken this down even further. He's got things out there that aren't even in the book. It depends on how far you want to go with it. But who here wants to win the day? I hope everybody. So let's focus on that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you would help us to be more focused Focusing on accomplishing the things you would have us to do and allow us to get rid of the things in our life that would distract us from hearing your voice, Lord. Allow us to hear your voice. Allow us to know what you are calling us to do. We ask that you would equip us and use us to the furtherance of your kingdom. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.